In 1898, Guam was officially declared as a United States territory after the Spanish-American War. Change was in the midst when the Americans arrived. Government, law, and cultural tradition changes occurred. Some say that this was only the beginning of Guam's suffering. In 1941, after being one of the neglected territories of the U.S., Guam was invaded by Japanese soldiers. They invaded Guam as it was a valuable supply base for passing Japanese ships. The Japanese had taken part in the execution and enslavement of thousands of Chamorro lives. They were forced out of their homes to do long hours of labor, working on the fields, repairing airstrips, and creating defense installations, only to get a handful of rice. The Chamorro suffering lasted for four years. Eventually, on July 21st of 1944, the United States returned to save what was left of the Chamorros. It was only after liberating the Chamorros that the Americans realized how useful Guam could be and its potential. My name is Michael Lujan Lavacqua. I'm the curator at the Guam Museum, which means I, I do educational stuff for the museum and all sorts of things. Chamorros are excited because the United States represents democracy, it represents liberty and freedom. A young Ramon Sablan, who was the first Chamorro doctor in the 1920s, when a group of American elected leaders were visiting Guam, he asked, are we fish or are we fowl? Which was basically saying, what are we to the United States? Your flag flies here, you tell us to speak English. You tell us America is the greatest country in the world, and then you tell us that we are nothing. After the World Wars, the Americans took large interest in our island. The U.S. military obtained land and built bases that encompass about 25% of Guam. The effects of the arrival of the Americans were not all negative. 200,000 military personnel arrived and stayed because they fell in love with Guam and its beauties. This led to an increase in jobs and business opportunities on the island. Along with the new opportunities, the Americans helped rebuild what was destroyed by the invasion. Schools, churches, and administrative buildings were reconstructed. The American bishop on Guam requested for the religious sisters to assist in the development of the island's Catholic school system. Our school, Father Duenas Memorial School, was first built by the Catholic Church in 1947 and Academy of Our Lady of Guam in 1949. Guam had the attention of the United States and was subjected to the same treatment as the other territories. At the start, political leaders consisted solely of people chosen by the president. The Organic Act of Guam was signed into law on August 1st, 1950 by President Harry S. Truman. The act granted American citizenship to all persons residing in Guam at the time of its enactment and to their children who were born after April 11, 1899. Based on the Organic Act of Guam, it was an unincorporated territory. This meant that Guam was nothing more than an object to the U.S. and could be sold or given away at any time. Though the Chamorros were given citizenship, they were not given all its benefits. They neither could vote for their governor nor for the U.S. president. The rules of the American democracy did not fully apply to Guam. The Chamorros facing westernization introduced a form of hatred, discrimination. The Chamorros lived through respect and kindness for others, but the Americans portrayed the opposite. Guam's minuscule population presented easy means of controlling the island. As American influence pursued, many traditions became obfuscated. Since their arrival in the 1930s, it was clear they did not want the Chamorros to speak their native language in public and official settings. Naval leaders greatly despised it and considered it as a cognitive deficiency. By 1940, it was recorded in a census that English was spoken by 75% of Guam's population over the age of 10. In 1941, a Navy official noted that one hears occasional English conversations on the street, something unheard of a few years ago. Not speaking English set limitations. If one wanted to work for the Navy in the fields of education, nursing, or law enforcement, English was mandatory. 
This trend toward English speaking accelerated in the immediate post-war era as the military and civilian government opened up jobs for English speakers. Along with the language, the Chamorros eventually lost morals because of westernization. The Chamorros were free, yet they were still enslaved to the white man's ideologies and left tied to the shackles of the American dream. The people of Guam finally began to gain a voice. Joseph Flores was the first Chamorro to be appointed as the governor of Guam, who took office on July 9, 1960. Our first Magalahi, whom was the last to be appointed in 1969 and the first to be locally elected, was Carlos Camacho in 1970. Antonio B. Juan Pat was elected to the Advisory Guam Congress in 1936 and served until it was disbanded when war broke out. After the war, Juan Pat organized the Commercial Party of Guam, the island's first political party. The Commercial Party evolved into the Popular Party in 1950 and to the Democratic Party of Guam in 1960. Antonio B. Juan Pat continued to fight for representation in Congress, leading him to gain allies. Allies included California Congressman Philip Burton, a member of the House Interior and Insular Affairs Committee. Burton gained support of Committee Chairman Wayne Aspinall and 20 co-sponsors. Public Law 92271 was passed on April 10, 1972, which gave Guam and the Virgin Islands representation in Congress for two-year terms. Juan Pat became the Chamorro to take the oath of office as a member of the 93rd Congress on January 3, 1973. I always remember a quote from, uh, they called him Kiko Suilu, or F.B. Leon Guerrero. And he was uh, older than Tony Juan Pat, but also a pioneer in terms of the push for political rights for the Chamorro people. In the late 60s, he gave a speech in which he said, you know, everything, you know, everything that we did before has come to this point. You know, I have no regrets, um, but in our time, there were, there were places that even angels dare not to tread. But for the next generation, there's nothing to be afraid of. It's in your hands. After, the world, after world War II, Everything got set up so that to improve, all you do is get more from the United States. But what he was saying is actually, part of that was because people in his time were afraid to say that they wanted anything other than the United States. And towards the end of his life, F. B. Leon Guerrero was somebody who felt that Guam should maybe have its own authority, not, not break away from the United States entirely, but that Guam should maybe be able to do its own thing. Today, the people of Guam are now trying to reunite themselves with the culture that was lost in the past. There is still American influence on Guam through their continuity and utilizing it as a place to conduct military operations. However, we now have schools to teach the children of Guam the native language, as English still remains dominant at 43.6% and with Chamorro only at 17.8%. We have museums to preserve our rich history and other places of interest to show the results of the frontier of the past, influencing the new frontiers in the oncoming future. The frontier of Guam becoming a U.S. territory and citizenship allowed for the people to experience benefits, benefits that took time to receive. With the frontiers of Antonio B. Wanpat and Carlos Camacho, they enabled the commencement of the Chamorro's having a say in matters bigger than themselves. The Chamorros were finally treated as people after a century of being treated as a possession of another man's country.